Buonasera. Oh, grazie. Um, I'd like to welcome you all um, this evening to, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody that's here with us today, but also everyone at home who's watching. Um, my name is Catherine Sama. I'm professor of Italian and film media at URI. And it is my great pleasure to um, get things started this evening. Um, before we get started, I just want to uh, let you know that the exits are to the side of the stage or the back of the auditorium. So just like in an airplane, you might want to check which is closest to you. There are unisex bathrooms out in the lobby to the left. Please silence your phones and no photos or camera recording during the event. Um, and right now I'd like to introduce uh, Crystal Baker who will make our land acknowledgement statement. Crystal Baker is a wife, mother of two, and enrolled citizen of the Narragansett Indian tribe. She's a graduate of the University of Rhode Island, holding a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education and social studies. She joined the Tomaquags team as Indigenous Empowerment Education Coordinator in October of 2021. Thank you, Crystal. Very happy to be here this evening um, to share uh, just a little something that I wrote um, to welcome you to the indigenous lands of the Narragansett peoples and just to share a little something about, I know that you are talking about food and food sovereignty, so I just wrote a little something to go along with tonight's uh, or this series. Food is one resource all people share the need for. The ability to forage, hunt, and grow your own was an inalienable right of indigenous populations all over the world. Learning from childhood what to forage, easily identifying the edible, the medicinal, and the poisonous, it would no doubt have contributed to our lives being much healthier. Colonization had a massive impact on these traditional practices, leaving an ongoing legacy of life-threatening diseases such as heart disease, kidney disease, and diabetes. Generations became dependent upon government commodities and rations due to dispossession of land and waterways and restrictive policies. The disruption to traditional foodways is an ever-evolving challenge thanks to fast food industry, large food chains, and food shipment practices. At Tomaquag Museum, when we provide traditional ecological knowledge walks and talks, we share teachings passed down to us from our ancestors, celebrating our relationship with the natural world around us from the uses of native plants to the strangulation by invasives, what if the colonists, having learned from the indigenous peoples of this land, had respected that knowledge and assimilated to indigenous ways of knowing and reciprocity? There could have been a sharing and working together to sustain themselves and the land we would probably not be here today discussing ways to create equitable, sustainable, and resilient food systems. Acknowledging the mistakes of the past and learning from it is vital to us all, now and for generations yet to come. We must learn together, work together, and teach together. Doors need to be opened and land and water resources need to be respected and honored. What will you do to ensure the inalienable right to food sovereignty? To Botniana Wayan, have a good night. Thank you, Crystal, for your time and your wise words. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Diana Garvin. Uh, Diana is assistant professor uh, of Italian 
with a focus on Mediterranean studies at the University of Oregon. She received her PhD from Cornell University and her AB from Harvard. Oh, excuse me. Cosa ho fatto? Okay. <laughs> um, her research has been supported by Fulbright, Getty Library, Oxford University, Wolfsonian, FIU, the Julia Child Foundation, and many other fellowships. Diana conducted her postdoctoral research at the American Academy in Rome as the 2017-18 Rome Prize winner for Modern Italian Studies. In her teaching, she uses food to explain Italian history to the world. Her lectures explore topics like the birth of Neapolitan pizza, futurist food, and the G8 pesto debate. As a culinary historian, Diana writes and comments on the politics of food for publications like the Washington Post, Punch, and Savor, or Savor, je sais pas, and speaks on podcasts like the Los Angeles Review of Books, 55 Voices for Democracy, and Heritage Radio Network's A Taste of the Past. Her book, Feeding Fascism, The Politics of Women's Food Work, uh, excuse me is the basis for tonight's lecture, and it garnered Garvin a prestigious Modern Language Association Award. And I would just close with a fun fact that Diana's favorite Italian proverb is, o mangi questa minestra o salti dalla finestra. Eat this soup or jump out the window. <laughs> so I'm sure she can explain what that means to us. When she gets up here, please join me in giving Dr. Garvin a warm welcome to URI. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, I think first I'll try to get this switched over. Um, but you can see there are a lot of people to thank for this. Um, so in fact, might as well know exactly all of the folks who have helped bring this event together today, um, to whom I am very grateful. Um, so you know, maybe we blank out. Um, oh, it's not switching. So first, I want to say a huge thank you um, to, uh, I'll go by first name since uh, happily that's how we've all been chatting together today. So a huge thank you to Marta for putting together um, so much organization for the Honors Colloquium. Um, a big thank you to John for letting me come to your class and chat with all of your brilliant and just really interesting students. Um, a big thank you to Anna for so much organization behind the scenes. Um, and I'm already very grateful to Katie for so much help with getting mic'd up um, connecting all of the different wires, getting things going, um, and most importantly, a big thank you to Kat um, for inviting me to chat with you guys today. Um, Julia Child had once said that people who love to eat are the best people, and after having shared a wonderful dinner with some of the students here already, I can say that is definitely the case at URI, so I'm so happy to get to be able to chat with you today. Thank you so much. So today, we're going to be talking about a period that can feel really divorced from our own. But I think you'll see some incredibly interesting and some scary um, resonance between what's happened with food in the past and today. So how did women negotiate the politics of Italy's fascist regime in their day-to-day -day lives? Um, this talk, which is drawn from my new book, Feeding Fascism, The Politics of Women's Food Work, looks at, um, it tackles this uh, question with a new body of evidence that's drawn from food and foodways. So over the past decade, um, I've been in a lot of attics. I've been tracking down cookbooks, 
Um, I've been looking at kitchen utensils, cafeteria plans, um, and culinary propaganda. I've been to um, 30 different Italian museums, libraries, and archives, um, just all these amazing jewel box spots that are hidden deep in the northern Italian countryside. And this talk aims to connect women's political beliefs with the places that they lived and worked and the objects that they owned and borrowed. These examples illustrate how women in the fascist state vied for control um, over the national diet across many different manifestations. Cooking, feeding, eating, all to assert and negotiate their authority. And in taking this distinctive approach, feeding fascism attests to the power of food. So the focus of this story is specific, both in terms of a place and in terms of a time. In terms of place, it looks primarily at north central Italy. I'm going to try this guy. So we're looking at about this portion of the map. Um, so this is regions like Lombardy, Piedmont, um, Emilia Romagna. Milan, Turin, and Genova created an industrial triangle. So this was a powerhouse of factory work. And along with Bologna the Red, these cities crackled with communism. Um, so their long labor history is pockmarked by strikes. And yet, the opposite political pole actually stood in the exact same place. Mussolini was born in Predapio, which is a small town in Emilia-Romagna. So what that means is this zone was at once the area of great, greatest adherence to and greatest resistance against the fascist regime. In terms of time, we're looking at what's called the fascist ventennio. So that's the 20 odd years of fascist rule that extends from 1922 to 1945. Um, and in fact, we've got the dubious distinction of doing this in October 2022, um, which means that we're now at the centenary, 100 years past the March on Rome when Mussolini officially took power. And this period provides a particularly clear lens for looking at women's food work. Um, it's not so much representative of Italian cultural history as it's hyper-representative. Um, fascism tends to blow up violent tendencies um, that are present in other time periods but in inactive or ineffective forms. So the bombast of dictatorial politics amplifies general tendencies in gendered food work that are often too hard to see. And what this means is the fascist period can function as something like a key to unlocking other historical time periods. Historian Benedetto Croce was wrong. Fascism is not a parenthesis. It's a magnifying glass. You might be wondering what's unique about food under fascism. After all, during the interwar period, allied and Axis nations alike were demonstrating um, profound concern for how food powered and shaped the body. But the Italian fascist regime went further. It tried to harness the biopolitical power of food to prepare for military dominance. First, farming more food in Italy promised economic self-sufficiency. And that was the first step towards diplomatic immunity. So this is part of the regime's broader push for autarky. Um, that's an important term for this talk, and it basically means producing and consuming only Italian products. Second, birthing more it infants today meant more fascists to support state ambitions tomorrow. Pronatalism, a fascist policy promoting high birth rates, was part of this. Autarky and pronatalism actually work together. Under fascism, you could say that Italian babies were the ultimate national product. So at stake in this blend of women's food work and reproductive work is a new way of looking at the history of fascism. Private industry and entrepreneurs translated fascist doctrine into practice. 
I argue that they were more successful in integrating fascism into everyday life than the regime was itself. So here's something of a table of contents for today's talk. To emphasize the fusion of women's food production and reproduction that took place under fascism, um, we're going to open by exploring the wild culinary fantasies of futurism, an art movement, to see how that shapes fascist food policy. Then we're going to open the doors of Luisa Spagnoli's Perugina Chocolate Factory to witness the birth of the bacho and to see the ad campaign that almost got Spagnoli arrested. Um, and then we're going to conclude with a walking tour of a model fascist kitchen to see how the fascist version of Martha Stewart translated doctrine into domesticity. And there's so much more that I wish that we could cover today. Um, but if you would like to learn more about the Barilla Pasta Factory, um, culinary protest songs and food theft, or the cooking fire riots of Rome, um, those are all things we can chat about more in the Q&A um, or in a copy of Beating Fascism. Let's see. Oh, and we're offline again. Yeah, bizarre. So there we go. I think the computer is trying to resist fascism as well, so I applaud its efforts. All right, so let's start with futurism. Um, we often talk about futurism as this weird fringe art movement. Um, and the father of futurism, F.T. Marinetti, was a provocateur. Um, his manifesto in 1909, so this is setting the stage for fascism, um, called on Italians to, quote, burn the museums. Um, he argued that, quote, war is the only hygiene of the world. This is a movement that celebrated dynamism, a break from the past, um, speed, technology, and violence. The futurists matter because they were influential fascists of the first hour. Their political party, the futurist political party, was folded into the fascist party in 1919. So even before the March on Rome, the quote, official start of fascism in 1922 and they were very interested in food. So part manifesto and part artistic joke, the futurist cookbook approached food as the raw material for art. Um, it posed poets and painters as cooks. Recipes provided instructions to prepare nocturnal love feasts, sculpted meats, candied atmospheric electricities, and ice cream on the moon. There's even an argument for the abolition of pasta Marinetti regarded pasta as, quote, an absurd Italian gastronomic religion and the embodiment of everything that was wrong with old liberal Italy. Um, it made the eater heavy and shapeless and induced, quote, pessimism, nostalgia, and neutralism. Worst of all for Marinetti, pasta was, quote, anti-viral. It was no food for fighters. Instead, Italians were encouraged to eat the wild formulas of futurist invention, um, like this diabolical rose, and that is the name of the recipe um, that you see up on the screen. It was served at the Holy Palette restaurant in Milan. This is one of the artist's sketches for that restaurant, um, which was the site of late night futurist happenings. So both the recipe and the restaurant embodied how futurists wanted to change Italian food. First, they were gonna Italianize everything. Um, so no more French or English foods, um, or even terms for those foods. Um, this cookbook came with a dictionary in the back. Um, a bar becomes a cuisi beve, one drinks here. 
um, and your barman became a barista. So that term that you hear now at Starbucks actually dates from this time, this period, and this cookbook. Now you might be asking why. Um, this is part of a much broader bid for Italian cultural prestige and dominance. The futurists also wanted to look at cooking as chemistry. Um, so they don't have recipes, they have what they call formulas. The kitchen is a laboratory. Um, and in those dishes, they want foods that have less mass. Um, they're arguing for powders and pills. The reason why is they see food as a means to militarize the population. Low mass foods for a muscular, fertile body. As Marinetti put it, quote, until now men have fed themselves like ants, rats, cats, and oxen. Now with the futurists, the first human way of eating is born. Now, futurists actually didn't have that much of an effect on how people ate. But they did heavily influence the fascist party and the food industry under fascism. So what I'm arguing for here is a percolating of futurism up through society to a much greater extent than people usually think. A lot of this had to do with introducing these wild new ways of looking at food, which took the heat off the regime and corporations when they later actually enact some of these ideas. So I don't mean that the futurists told the fascists what to do um, or vice versa. Rather, what I'm describing is this process of normalization that eased public acceptance of fascist food policy. But there are huge gaps between fascist ideology, so what the regime aimed to do, and then what the regime actually did. So how did fascist food policies introduced as ideas by the futurists actually touch the lives of Italian women? How did women respond? At the time that Marinetti wrote his manifesto, most Italians were eating la cucina povera. Um, so this is today much celebrated in restaurants as the food of the poor. But what it is in this time period is lots of grains, so risotto, polenta, things that are cheap, filling, um, lots and lots of vegetables, very little of the butter, the cheese, the meat, um, that many of us think of as making Italian food so very tasty today. Under fascism, what Italians ate didn't change that much. The main difference is that the talk that's surrounding food, um, the propaganda, the cookbooks, the domestic guides, um, suddenly you were helping the country by eating rice and beans. Fascism simply recast poverty as patriotism. Perugina was a major employer of women um, for the Italian food industry in the early days of fascism. And in fact, the city of Perugia served as the stage for the start of dictatorial rule. On the night of October 26, 1922, at the Hotel Brufani, a group of future fascist leaders and um, a few, uh, this group met. And these industrial titans declared the start of fascist rule even before the March on Rome actually reached its destination. So this second section of the talk opens the doors of the Perugina Chocolate Factory. The founder and boss, Luisa Spagnoli, was a woman, as were about 75% of the workers. And they fed their families, um, their husbands and children through their income. They also cooked meals at home and breastfed on the job. And they fed the nation through food production that was aligned with fascist policies of autarky and pronatalism, regardless of their own political affiliations. So Perugina provides a really good case study in these kinds of tensions feeding a family in the day-to-day -day through work that at the same time ultimately fed fascism. Luisa Sargenti Spagnoli was a powerful leader in Italian industry. Um, she was the daughter of a fishmonger who died early, 
Um, and Louisa started to work very young. She was an assistant to a seamstress. Um, and in fact, she was so young that she was sneaking home little bits of ribbon to play with as toys. She met her husband, Anibal Spagnoli, when he came to Perugia to, uh, to Perugia to play with the town band. And it was with her sewing savings that they bought a small drugstore and they started to make chocolates out the back by hand. Changing the store's candy making, um, so it was Louisa who introduced semi-mechanized production. Um, and she changes the store's candy making from artisanal to mechanical in short order. So by age 30, she is running a true industrial establishment. Um, she's got 400 workers, 300 of whom are women. She's got a slick modern plant. Um, and to manage Perugina chocolates, Louisa partners with pasta, namely with Francesco Buitoni. So they merge the companies to form Buitoni Perugina. Spagnoli was rare for achieving this kind of success um, as a female entrepreneur during the first decade of the fascist period. And it was a feat that she managed by leveraging regime policies of pronatalism and autarky to promote chocolate. In company operations, Louisa introduced a number of pronatalist measures. Um, so she adds health insurance, sick days for pregnancy, she covers husbands as dependents, um, there are nurseries for workers to breastfeed during the day, and there are even summer camps like this one for the children of employees. Now, this may seem very progressive. Um, plenty of companies today don't have the breastfeeding rooms that they are legally required to have in the United States. Um, but the intent behind this is fairly regressive. It's to get as many hours of work um, out of a factory worker as humanly possible. So it completely fused the private and public lives of these workers. Um, and it also brought their families into work. So suddenly everything is under the company's control. And indeed, fascism will later adopt many of these ideas, um, putting breastfeeding rooms in factories and creating summer camps for children because it provides an unusual degree of surveillance. In her company marketing, Louisa also promoted uh, pronatalism to a broader public. At trade fairs and newsreels and in cooking ma magazine ads, everything reminded consumers that Perugina supported their employees in becoming prolific mothers. And just to give you a sense of what a prolific mother meant in the day, the minimum was six children to attain the title. It also pushed the public to follow their lead. So for Easter, a holiday that's strongly associated with birth, um, Perugina filled their chocolate eggs with prizes, like baby booties made from Italian rabbit fur. It was a brilliant piece of cross-marketing. Um, Louisa had just begun a side business, a fashion house based on autarkic fabrics. Louisa geared her company to support fascist autarky in order to manage trade sanctions. So with importation constricted, there are fewer cacao pods coming in, and she needed to get every last bit out of the pods that did arrive on Italian shores. So to stretch the available product, she introduced new chocolates that were made from domestic ingredients that were available in abundance. Um, so one example would be she invents new kinds of candy, like cit uh, citrusy chocolate bars that featured Sicilian oranges. Um, so northern industry was able to get these ingredients on the cheap, buying in bulk from the Italian south. They were also cheaper um, because chocolate bars can use way more waste chocolate than hand-dipped chocolates. Um, and I happen to know this because through a very different family history, um, my family is Ashkenazi Jewish, and uh, my grandfather had a small chocolate business in the Lower East Side uh, when he first arrived in the States. Um, so I love looking at some of these different chocolate histories. Um, so chocolate bars, way more waste product than in individual bonbons. 
Paragina even promoted an autarkic week, um, a marketing festival that's similar to the Italian, uh, the fascist Sagre. So these were local food holidays that celebrated the town's signature harvest. And we can talk more about that if folks are interested. So Paragina produced, uh, their marketing included branded bags for carrying the candies, like this one. Um, and those candies were made with Italian hazelnuts, chestnuts, oranges, lemons, grapes, strawberries, pears, cherries. Saving scraps and using domestic fruits and nuts was not only lucrative, but it was an increasing necessity given the broader political picture. The bacho, invented by Luisa Spagnoli in 1922, uh, crafted luxury from leftovers. Making truffles and bonbons uh, resulted in excess chocolate and excess hazelnuts. So realizing the value that lay in those cast-offs, Louisa rolled a small handful of loose chocolate into a ball, topped it with a single hazelnut, and then covered the creation in fondant. And she named it cazzotto, or the punch, um, because the resulting form resembled a closed fist with one nut knuckle popping out of the top. But offering one's lover a box of punches was not very romantic. A marketing lightning bolt struck one steamy afternoon. As the company's fortunes rose, Luisa spent more and more time with Giovanni Spagnoli, Francesco's son and a marketing dynamo 15 years her junior. The two became lovers, and it was his idea to turn cazzotti into kisses, baci. In the next five years, over 100 million baci were distributed. Luisa and Anibali separated, and she continued to live and work with Francesco. Gossips shattered, but business boomed. Perugina produced 3,000 kilograms of chocolate per day, so that's 10 times its pre-war production. At the time, a journalist described her as, quote, an energetic and willful creature who had nobly impressed the factory with order, decorum, and elegance. Her industrial success even caught the eye of the Duce, the leader himself. For Perugina, 1923 was not only the year of the Baccio and the breakup, it was also the year of Mussolini. One year after the march on Rome, Mussolini returned to Perugia to visit the chocolate factory. Female factory workers in uniform white aprons and hair kerchiefs lined up for inspection in the factory's interior courtyard, their arms raised high in the Roman salute. After Mussolini visited the chocolate factory, it benefited from rationing in the army. Chocolate was not only one of the only luxury foods that was allowed by the regime, um, but it was actually included in the fascist rations because it was deemed critical for morale. So Perugina sustained ties with the regime, but Luisa Spagnoli did not always toe the party line. The relationship between Luisa Spagnoli and Benito Mussolini shifted in accordance with her entrepreneurialism. She acted to move her business forward, forcing him to react. One of the niceties um, that was communicated by Mussolini during his 1923 uh, visit was, quote, I tell you, and I authorize you to repeat it, that your chocolate is, tru is truly exquisite. So she tittered appreciatively, um, and then weeks later used the exchange as the basis for a marketing blitz so intense that the regime had to outlaw Perugina's use of Mussolini's testimonial or risk losing authority. The general pattern of Perugina's interaction with the fascist government was one of pushing the bounds through advertising as far as possible and then only retreating when the regime had said enough. An entrepreneur and an opportunist, Spagnoli used pronatalism as a means to pitch social services to her personnel. She identified broad moves in the domestic economy and addressed it with new kinds of chocolate treats. She cultivated Mussolini as a company advocate. 
Put broadly, she interpreted the regime's ideology and then used those insights to promote her company. So what this story illuminates is how fascism actually operated in women's day-to-day -day lives. It created incentives for autarky and pronatalism, which private companies then carried out in local contexts. So it was actually employers, um, especially those like Louisa, who created these total companies that fused women's public and private lives um, and bring the most intimate questions of how to feed a family under industry management. So we're about to look at some of these later bids um, for total control by the state. These are enacted in new kitchens built by the regime for public housing projects. So fascism is a total regime. What that means is it fuses public and private life. Um, it's goals for hyper productivity, more Italian food, more Italian babies, um, were aimed at women even in the home. Under fascism, kitchen design, so size, layout, even the color of the walls, became politicized. With workers moving from the country to the city for factory work, the urban peripheries swelled. And the regime introduced new contests for architectural firms to build the new public housing projects. Over and over, rationalist styles like this one won the contests. So you've probably seen rationalist buildings before and you probably didn't like them. Um, it's every parking garage that has ever been built. So think uh, concrete, reinforced uh, grids, right angles. Um, it's often criticized for feeling really cold, really modern, um, and it thrived under fascism. Um, supposedly, it celebrated logic, not, re uh, not lyricism. Um, supposedly, increases airflow and sunlight, promoting hygiene. Um, that's not actually true. Um, some of these designs can actually lead to a lot of wasted space. Um, and there's also a huge gap between the architectural theory and how the buildings end up actually getting used. Um, so because of that, I often think of this as uh, irrational rationalism. But it was really common in functional spaces. Um, so this is a functional space is any room that you need to do something. Um, that means things like clinics in public, kitchens and bathrooms in private. To give you a sense of kind of how much this changes things, um, for much of Italian history, the kitchen was the house. Um, most Italian homes consisted of one large multi-purpose room. And uh, warmth was the concern for kitchen design and use. So people, cows, chickens, everyone gathered together around the hearth fire. And because kitchens housed many bodies, um, both animal and human, Architects thought of them as, as these dark, dirty spaces. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the regime built much smaller kitchens throughout the public housing projects. Only one person could fit, and that person was a woman. So this move not only added more gendering to kitchens and cooking work, um, but it also turns the kitchen into a specialized workspace for the first time. Regime architects during this period did a lot of shrinking of rooms to promote certain activities across the board. Um, this is also the period, again, remember pronatalism, where private bedrooms appear in public housing for the first time. Um, you're not able to boost the population unless you have a bedroom. So it's all part of this pronatalist push. And in fact, if you had those six or more children, that moved you up the wait list for these new regime approved uh, apartment blocks. In parallel, the kitchen becomes a small sanitary factory um, with one purpose, to produce as much food as possible with speed and with hygiene. 
When the kitchen became a factory, it, it adopted some ideas from industrial settings and applied them to the private sphere. So Frankfurt kitchens came from German public housing projects. These are all kitchens that rely on something that's called a Taylorist work triangle um, and from factory studies of time management. Um, and a lot of kitchens are actually still laid out on this formula today. So these new, at least at the time, then new layouts aim to streamline cooking work um, by placing each step of cooking in a logical order. The cook moves from preparation at a work table to cooking at a stove, to cleaning at a sink, to placing the plated meals on a final counter under the cupboards. So every element aims to maximize productivity and space. On the pages of magazines like Domus, Casabella, and in person at the Triennale Conference, architects like Piero Boltoni and Ignazio Gardella debated what these new rationalist housing projects and their model kitchens should look like. So their names are public knowledge in Italy, uh, or they were public knowledge in Italy, but it wasn't because the average person was reading basically Italian equivalent of architectural digest. Instead, people knew about these recommendations because of domestic experts like Lydia Morelli. And I wish we had a photo of her. Um, unfortunately, it's so hard to track down um, the names, biographical records, but I do want to show you this book. So this is um, From the Kitchen to the Salon, and it was Morelli's blockbuster hit. By 1935, it had appeared in five editions and sold over 50,000 copies. So for some perspective, at the time, the Italian population was just under 43 million. In this book, Morelli was promoting her favorite Bottoni and Gardella kitchen designs. So you can think of this as basically like the trophy kitchens that we see today. This is the equivalent that you have in Italy in the 1930s. And what's so strange is these are kitchens that were already in use in the regime's public housing projects. Middle class fans of Morelli then adopt these ideas, um, like how to arrange a kitchen and what pots and pans to buy for home use. So Morelli's books show us how kitchens changed under fascism. They look at how the average woman, uh, they show how the average woman experienced fascism in her day to day life not in an obviously political setting, like at a public rally, but instead in a kitchen while she was peeling a potato. After all, most people didn't experience fascist modernity in a grand public display, so at a car race or an airplane show. For most people, all of those ideas, the speed, technology, hygiene, and even war, didn't slam into existence. Instead, they arrived as quickly and quietly as a kitchen drawer sliding open. Here's an example of one of Morelli's favorite kitchen designs. So standing at the kitchen entrance, we see a small white tiled room that's arranged in a Taylorist work triangle. You've got the prep area, so the table, the cooking area, the stove, and a cleaning area, the sink. And the photographer centers two key additions, the clock and the electric stove. So it's a quarter to two, and a three burner stove has a double boiler on it, um, and it also looks to be an apple crostata. To the right, we see a sink filled with dishes and two white towels hung from dedicated hooks. On the table, there's a half-peeled apple on a napkin next to a small serrated knife um, and a white ceramic plate, plus a mixing bowl that's filled with flour. Against the wall, glass cabinets open to reveal immaculate white dishware and shining aluminum pans. Just below, the countertop holds the ingredients and machines for preparing espresso. 
sugar, coffee, and a coffee grinder, which is a new appliance for the period. A black cord snakes between the grinder and the wall, and that marks an otherwise invisible innovation. This kitchen is wired for electricity. Electricity and hydraulics were new additions for public housing in this period. In the kitchen, they radically changed cooking habits and hygiene levels. Less obviously, they also reshaped the female body. So let's say I want to toast a piece of bread. Ooh, yes. Um, so let's say that I want to toast a piece of bread. In my 19th century Italian farm kitchen, um, I've got a big open fireplace. I need to lean over the flames, hold up a heavy iron grill, um, and over time, that's going to redden and roughen my face, hands, and arms. Um, it's going to start building out my biceps. But with my new aluminum Ital Toast toaster, I just push a button. So the kitchen stays cleaner. There's no wood smoke, no ashes. Um, plus, I have that sink now for easy cleanup. And all those highly visible body parts stay delicate, white, and unmuscled all the markers of female upper-class status in northern Italy at this time. Bringing electric and hydraulic infrastructure into the home not only cleans the kitchen, it gentrifies the body. So this isn't to say that the fascist regime is using a toaster army to dominate the public, um, but rather it's an example of how a private company is making use of the new regime-funded infrastructure as well as futurist aesthetics of speed and technology in order to push a product. And indeed, ad copy for the Ital Toast Toaster focuses on the machine's autarkic materials, aluminum and chrome, and shows one of the new Milanese housing block kitchens. It casts fascism as fashion. This is, the ad copy claims, the most patriotic way to make toast. Model fascist kitchens were built from autarkic materials. So walls were tiled in white or blue, um, and it created business for Italy's growing ceramic industry in Emilia-Romagna. Floors were made from aluminum, synthesized in Milanese factories, and the Bialetti mocha pot, born in 1933, was aluminum, as were so many pots and pans and appliances. So we often ask whether food changes in a certain historical time period. But what we don't ask as often is how the physical kitchen and all of the tools change in a certain time. Lydia Morelli celebrated these materials for being cheap and easy to use but they also, supported, they also provided direct financial support to Italian chemical industry and refineries. They helped the fascist economy by creating demand for the new materials. In addition to supporting autarky, these materials all share one more quality. When you wipe them clean, they shine. It's part of their allure, but it also makes dirt really obvious. And that fact mattered for the public housing projects. Living here meant that you did not have a lot of money, but you did have a lot of kids. After all, that was one of the requirements for housing. Many relied on the fascist-run cafeterias for mothers. So these were dedicated soup kitchens and dispensaries for food. And using those particular services came with a string attached. Frequent visits from the wives of fascist officials to make sure that the hygiene of the kitchen was up to snuff. With these new materials, the visitatrice, or the visitor, could make that judgment at a glance. New materials seem like modernizations, but they also supported autarky and opened these working class kitchens to regime surveillance. In 1939, Italy entered the Pact of Steel with Nazi Germany. Italian foods like tinned tomatoes and the factory workers who produced them flowed northward to Germany, both voluntarily and through conscription. Rationing was introduced, black markets boomed. 
Finding enough food to eat, especially in the cities, was a difficult task. During the early 1940s, each social class's diet fell to the nutritive levels of the one below. School teachers, pensioners, and government employees sought charity and frequented the soup kitchens. Cookbook authors like Petronilla, the pseudonym for Dr. Amalia Moretti Folgia, offered recipes for chicken soup without the chicken. As war went on, recipes changed. Ingredients started to come at the top of the recipe for the first time, so that if you'd already used up your ration of rice, you saw it right at the top and you didn't have to read any further. And cooking methods changed too. Um, there's more cold food under the assumption that you're rationing your gas as well as your rice. Middle class food started to look much more like tougher working class diets. That means more foraged food, like frogs and bird eggs and greens from the hills. People also ate things that they didn't before, more guts, like blood soup. Wartime pushed women to negotiate the boundaries of Italian cuisine, um, the outer limits of taste and edibility. But this doesn't mean they engaged in those projects willingly. Maybe Folge's conclusion to her recipes is the most telling. In her final cookbook and her work as an author, she concludes with a plea for peace at the expense of her legacy. Over the image of a white dove, she wishes for the demise of her life's work. Quote, may the war end and may my work here become irrelevant, consigned forever to a dusty kitchen shelf. During World War II, civilian morale was low, food shortages were endemic, and hundreds of thousands fled for the countryside. Partisan resistant groups in Italy spread northward, clashing with fascist and Nazi troops. Mussolini was shot in April 1945 and his body displayed in Milan. Northern Italian factories, including Perugina and Buitoni, were subject to heavy allied bombing, especially in 1942 and 1943. So the industrial areas of Milan, Turin, and Geneva were flattened. Long after fascism was discredited as a movement and Mussolini has met his end, the architectural and social legacy of many of these ideas lives on. In her much cited New Yorker article, Ruth ben Ghiat asked, why are there still so many fascist monuments standing in Rome? Because fascism coincided with and encouraged industrialization, it left its traces in farms and factories and in the way that many people cook and eat today. And in many ways, fascist moves like the industrialization of the food industry, its speed and its total invasion of private life actually gained greater ground after the fall of the regime. I'm very sorry to have to show you this picture. Out of the post-war rubble um, of the late 1940s and with the help of the Marshall Plan, larger, more modern food factories were built. So filled with gleaming metal machinery, they pumped out new lab-borne foods. Frozen ravioli that never went bad, powdered juice, geometric cheeses with no need for a knife. So you could almost feel Marinetti and the Futurists nodding along. Now, these foods definitely did not take over Italian cuisine, um, far from it. Uh, Italian cuisine is itself famously conservative in the sense of being slow to take on new ingredients and preparations. But it does change, bit by bit. Um, after all, for most of the peninsula's history, tomatoes, um, a now classic ingredient, were considered poisonous. This is a period where not only food changes, but the way that people buy, store, and cook changes. The Italian economic boom of the 1950s and 60s brought huge social shifts. So mass migration from south to north, urban peripheries swell with new arrivals, um, and more kitchens, like the ones pioneered under the fascist model, are built. With more cash on hand, many Italians began to eat more and better food. 
So more meat, more cheese, more milk, more pasta. Um, you can check out the enormous size of the steaks in this Calvinator ad. Um, and those foods were coming from the new supermarket chains, um, like S. Lunga, the long S, um, which was designed by Gio Ponti, one of the many architects um, with, the, with regime ties who simply kept working. So did Luisa Spagnoli and her chocolates. So did Delia Notari, head of the La Cucina Italiana magazine. Um, so did Lydia Morelli and her household guides. Um, many Italians called it the Gioco delle Sedia, or musical chairs. In this time of huge changes, the domestic experts who everyone took advice from actually stayed the same. This is why studying food matters um, and why looking at history matters. Fascism coincided with industrialization. Um, so that means that a lot of periods, a lot of buildings got put up in a period um, that's marked by the goals of the dictatorship. Um, again, it's not that food changes that much under fascism, but it's that so much of the buildings and the bureaucracy that comes with them, um, who works and for how long and under what conditions, um, plus home design and use, Got put, into peer, got put into place with dictatorial goals in mind, and then forgotten. Italy never had a Nuremberg, um, no national reckoning with the dictatorship, in part because it was so entrenched in everyday life. So Italian food companies, um, especially those whose industrial history extends back to the Ventennio, are now in a unique position whether due to product names, recipes, or previous government ties, they can tell a certain story about Italian history and national identity. We might place consumer products like pasta within the context of debates regarding monuments and museums. They become all the more important in the face of political movements that attempt to resurrect idealized versions of a national past. Objects like toasters and candy bars are scripts that prompt us to act in different ways. And if we can understand their historical origins, then we have the opportunity to use them or intentionally misuse them as we choose. Kitchens matter because they're the places where memory gets written. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, so, um, you know, in the context of my, well, first of all, I would just want to say, uh, I graduated from here last year and I, mm -hmm. I haven't been back until I saw the topic of this. Uh, <laughs> this uh, talk and I just had to come. I'm very deeply interested in this, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, but in the context of Italy today, you know, with uh, Maloney and the Fratelli d'Italia, um, which, how do you see this, this sort of, um, how do you see this sort of uh, uh, tr tradition, I guess, mm -hmm. of, of um, using food and culture uh, to, uh, to create that nationalist identity uh, moving forward, I guess is my question. Great, thank you so much for that question. Um, it really is probably one of the things we should be talking about the most here today. Um, so just so that we're all on the same page with um, Georgia Maloney, the current elections. Um, so earlier this month, Georgia Maloney um, was elected Prime Minister of Italy. Um, so she is going to be part of a coalition government between the Brothers of Italy and um, the League. 
So this is a probably the most far right group we've had in power in Italy since Mussolini. And in fact, there actually is a Mussolini descendant in the new cabinet, which is pretty heartbreaking. Um, so in terms of the food, this is something that's uh, really worth watching out for. Maloney's first public appearance that she decided to do was from um, Coldretti. Um, and I'll have to ask the honors colloquium to excuse us since we already got to dig into some of these uh, good ideas already. Um, but you'll be the experts for everyone afterwards. Um, so Coldretti is Italy's biggest farmers union. And that is who Maloney wanted to talk with first. So right, of, right away, the fact that of all the different groups she wants to talk with, she chooses a farmers union signals that food is going to be on the agenda for Italy coming up next and for this new far right group that's coming in. Um, at this event, she spoke about her goals for the new government coming in in terms of food. And she did something very alarming and that's worth just understanding how it works. She argued for sustainability and for um, food sovereignty but completely redefined those terms. So this is kind of one of the hallmarks to look for in, um, usually in fascist regimes, is new speak. Um, it's one of, uh, there's one theory of fascism, which is uh, basically the fascist minimum. What are some of the different characteristics you can look for? Um, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, then you have a duck. So one of those things is new speak. When you start saying war is peace, peace is war, that whole Orwellian thing. So she said she's going to go for sustainability in Italian agriculture. But her definition was, quote, the environment, yes, but with man at the center. Um, in practice, what she said that she wanted that uh, to look like was um, the EU was considering some new limits on fertilizers. She said no that's not sustainable because it's not economically sustainable. So she added economy to the definition um, and a much more short-term version of sustainability. So that was one. The one that really struck me was food sovereignty. Um, as we talked about uh, in the class today, food sovereignty is an idea that actually comes from the left. Um, so there's this very odd borrowing of terms from the left and then reconfiguring them just basically saying, oh, that's a hot idea. Um, we like that, but I'm going to make it mean something completely different. So her definition of food sovereignty was made in Italy, yes, but it was Italian food tradition pushed all the way to exclusion. Um, so there's sort of a sliding scale between celebrating tradition, yes, good, and then something like um, Matteo Salvini, who was uh, one of the uh, former, and actually will be again, a big politician in this, um, saying, I want to introduce legislation to close, quote, the little ethnic shops um, because they are hotbeds of criminal activity. So he had tried to introduce culinary legislation that was based on the shopkeeper's skin tone. Um, there were attempts to um, have new zoning laws so you couldn't open, uh, quote unquote, foreign food eateries in Italian historic cores. But what actually happened was uh, Japanese sushi restaurants opened, American burger joints, French creperies. Um, what were not allowed to open were kebab shops. So there is what's called for in law and then what's actually done in practice. Um, so that continuing line um, from this sort of arguing of poverty as patriotism that we see starting with Mussolini, then going all the way to celebrating local products but to the exclusion of all others, I think that's where you start to see some of that culinary nationalism now. Thank you. More questions? You can walk my dinner here. Uh, 
Hi. Uh, I first came across your work while um, tracing back the melody of Bella Chow, and I came across oh, yes. your article, Singing Truth mm -hmm. to Power. Um, and I, this is, I guess, a multi-part question. Um, mm -hmm. As uh, someone who traces a lot of music history, I probably ran into similar problems as you and we deal with quote unquote traditional um, music that is only available um, in oral tradition, which gets really hairy. Uh, and so what I had come across was sort of what you had mentioned in your article as well, where um, like the chicken and the egg. So I had found the melody in um, an East Ashkenazi uh, Yiddish song Mm -hmm. among three other Italian songs as well. And I was wondering if you ever found written melody or lyrics or if it all relied on oral tradition. And then um, I guess as a follow-up to that, um, what, like, how, how do you traverse the... Um, academic issues that come mm -hmm. with, with um, only oral tradition? Oh, that's a great question. So first, I have to say, we had a really nice correspondence. So I hope that uh, if anyone's interested in continuing to follow some of these topics, I'd love to write back and forth with you. Um, so we've chatted a little bit in the past about the song Bella Ciao. Um, how many folks have heard the song Bella Ciao? OK, that's a fair amount. So, it is increasingly popular now, um, and that's because it is, first, just a really amazing song. It's a resistance song. Most people know it as the, um, uh, as the Partigiani song, so the anti-fascist song, um, Bella Ciao, Bella Ciao. I apologize, Bella Ciao, Ciao, Ciao. So it's a great shouting rhythm. Um, and what a lot of folks don't know is it actually started as a protest song among um, the Mondine, which are the female rice weeding uh, workforce. Um, so they did uh, migratory agricultural labor for 40 days every year to weed the rice paddies. Um, and they recorded a huge song core. So to keep their spirits up, even as their bodies flag, they're singing these um, really beautiful songs through the fields. Um, the songs are really characteristic because they have uh, this amazing percussive core. Um, and it's because there were so many mosquitoes in the fields, they were slapping their arms. Um, so all of that kind of drumming comes from that. So it's just an amazing core. They're really tough to track because it is oral histories. Um, so yes, I actually have seen some original scores. Um, you can get those at the Archivio Diaristico in Pieve Santo Stefano. Um, it's this really amazing diary archive, way off the beaten track. There used to be one bus that would go there at like 6 a.m. on a Tuesday from Arezzo, so it is not easy to get to. Um, but I guess part of the problem um, with uh, some of the history, which can also be a lot of fun to research, but it's just hard, is um, archives look like the, subject, the historical subjects they contain. I wanted to, and it sounds like you also want to look at um, you know, this crew, which is, uh, you know, tends towards working class women. Um, they were underfunded in life and the archives are underfunded now. So going way out into the countryside to where some of these folks were, um, in, a lot of them learned to read and write later in life. So they actually did record their memories and happily Arezzo is pretty close to the rice weeding region, so you'll get more of those. Um, and some of them did write, like, write down to the musical staffs and everything. Um, you can also find those at the CGIL archives, so all the really tiny township level workers archives across Italy. Um, so kind of like in the United States, um, where we had this big resurgence in folk songs in the late 60s, Italy had the same thing, only they're using all of these amazing rice weeder songs because um, those were the protest songs. Um, so the Bella Ciao that you hear now is actually written by these female rice weeders and it has really different lyrics. Um, their whole song core, if you have time to just do a YouTube search or to maybe see the beautiful neorealist film uh, Bitter Rice, um, those are actual rice weeders singing in the background. They're, um, they're people who were right in the fields. Um, and you can actually find their memories of the filming in those same archives.
Any more questions? No? Thank you so much for your <laughs> thought-provoking talk, Dr. Garvin. Um, we heard a lot about the tightening of gender roles mm -hmm. and how the man becomes the virile, muscular, mm -hmm. warlike um, individual, and then mm -hmm. the woman becomes the soft, delicate mm -hmm. homemaker. And um, I'm glad you quoted Marinetti at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Something else Marinetti says is to spurn women yeah. and to <laughs> completely reject the emotional, mm -hmm. irrational, everything that is feminine and female and mm -hmm. womanly. And so it struck me as very curious when you said there's, there was chocolate in the rations for the, for the fascists. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you have any more thoughts on that. Was this a sort of exception to the rule? Was chocolate yeah. still sort of associated with the irrational and the mm -hmm. emotional and they're making an exception? These soldiers can have this one bit um, yeah. to boost morale mm -hmm. or was chocolate recast in a virile way? Oh, that's such a, it's really, the chocolate history is so interesting. So thank you so much for bringing us uh, back to that. Um, so, um, what Hillary is talking about is um, a really bizarre moment in history of food in Italy. So um, we don't think about chocolate as being something that's super fancy right now. It's kind of a Valentine's Day thing, maybe it's something you get down at the drugstore, but it felt really different in 1920s and 30s Italy. So first, um, you wouldn't find it most places. You would find it in some of the very new uh, shop store windows. And this is a time when there's not a whole lot of entertainment, so it's a big thing to do the evening passeggiata, to do the promenade through the city, and look at the way the windows are displayed. Um, during this period, people are hiring specific designers just to do the windows of different stores. And the chocolate windows are amazing. There's a really incredible industrial designer, Emma Bonazzi, who's got a collection of chocolate boxes at the Wolfsonian Museum that no one has studied, and somebody should definitely do this project. Um, really amazing, forgotten industrial female designer in Italy. Um, so she's designing these very elegant chocolate boxes. It wouldn't come in cardboard. It came in these beautiful, um, wooden and metal boxes. So chocolate is high, high luxury. Um, and for the soldiers, in some memoirs that I've written, it felt like getting a valentine from the state. It is the weirdest emotional moment to imagine. Um, it is this thing that the state is giving people that has these very romantic, good living, um, you know, very like in a romantic assumed hetero relationship and it's the state giving it to a male soldier and it's a, you know, a sort of you will depend on us, you will bind to us. It's the, just the strangest um, thing to imagine. But it made a lot of these folks, uh, many of whom had been veterans of the First World War, um, who returned home to, who felt they had done a great service um, and returned home to uh, diminished uh, prospects, unemployment, not great health care. Um, they were sad, they were lonely, they were very familiar with guns, and they were the first folks who the fascists went after looking for recruits. So that sort of the state showing um, this very, using this very specific emotional manipulation um, it could have been done with anything other than food. There's so little else, maybe music, um, but that's that loaded. Thank you. Diana, thank you so much for a fascinating political historical tour, tour de force of food. Um, I don't think I will ever look at a poster again without remembering, <laughs> remembering your talk. I also want to, um, before we thank um, 
Diana. I also want to remind you that next week we have another fascinating talk and it's going to bring up some of the other issues that Diana, mm -hmm. and we have Saru Jajaraman talking about labor and food. And Diana, thank you again. Oh, thank you guys so much. This is really a pleasure. <laughs>